know what's weird? Christmas videos made in February. T-shirts that are made to look like sweaters. And Rankin Bass sequels. Okay, let's be fair. I think it's a rule of thumb, a good rule of thumb, that if you got a sequel, and it's a sequel to a children's film, then it's probably going to be bad or at least disappointing. In fact, I'm going to be more fair than that. I'm going to go on ahead and say that most sequels are inherently terrible. The way I see it, you got two different basic forms of bad sequels, right? Okay, number one, you got the film that tries to duplicate everything about the first film, but uh, for some reason misses something essential in why the first film was good, or just seems totally soulless compared to the first project. Then you got my other favorite kind, and that is the film that ha obviously has nothing to do with the first film, and either just had the title literally slapped on at the last minute, or just features the main character from the first film, or just has some other aspect from the first film stapled on so they can try and build off the momentum of the, off the first project without actually watching it again. Of course, these can be disappointing because often these films leave open blatant doors, literal blatant doors, for, narr for sequels and narrative concepts and projects, and all that can just be left behind in an attempt to, to rush something out that will make a quick buck. Either way. Rankin Bass, obviously, is not an exception to this. In fact, they often stick to the rule. Now, one mid little franchise we're going to be talking about today is that of Frosty the Snowman. Now, the first one was really something magical and really worth seeing. It had a memorable cast of characters beyond the lead of the film, and was able to create a very suspenseful story in a few minutes. Now, I, I'm sure that many other people in many other households would point to the other animated classic about a snowman that comes to life as something that they find more dramatic and more heart-touching, and really something they prefer to visit more often, but I still think that Frosty the Snowman is good on its own regards. And of course, once the big corporate guys at Rankin Bass realized that Frosty was becoming a marketable symbol of Christmas, it was quite inevitable that they'd try and cash in on that festive cash cow by making another film starring the main character. Some might expect me to start talking about the 1992 Frosty Returns, which often airs with the original special and is thus misidentified as a sequel by many. It looks pretty alright from what I've seen, but it's not a Rankin Best production. It's not even the original Frosty. In my eyes, reviewing this as a sequel to the original film would be like reviewing Metal Man as Iron Man 4. Although, and this is true, I found out in doing some research while editing the Rudolph film, that, that too might also be unlicensed. Oops. But no, 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 no. Today we're looking at Frosty's Winter Wonderland, a 1976 film produced by the original company in an attempt to give Frosty a second chapter. And right off the bat, the film is clearly trying to stick to its money. We start off on a group of children who build a snowman in the freshly layered grounds and attempt to make it come to life by giving it the perfect hat. It does not, and the children lament that Frosty may never return as he once promised. Ah, uh, he's not gonna come to life. Of course not. He's not Frosty the Snowman. Only the real Frosty can come to life. Gee, I wish he'd come back from the North Pole. Yeah, it's not warm here anymore. He wouldn't melt. He said he'd come back again someday. I wonder if he really meant it. Now, if you've got a keen eye and a knowledge of Christmas classics, you may notice the first big discrepancy here. And that is, very obviously, that the kids in this film are wearing pants. Now, this is a very obvious directional turn from the original, and in my eyes, it already is making a huge misstep removing so much of the artistic integrity from the first film in just a lazy attempt to appeal to general audiences. Also though- THESE AREN'T THE SAME FUCKING KIDS! Jesus, did that bother me as a kid. I mean, it really did! The kids from the first film are well done and memorable. You got Karen, whose delicate voice almost defines her entire character. How about... Frosty? But it's not yours anymore! 
You threw it away. You've got to excuse him, sir. You see, he just came to life, and he doesn't know much about such things. You got Oatmeal Kid, who clearly has had some serious brain damage in recent years. Oatmeal? Oatmeal? You got the Olsen twins here that obviously are possessed by one singular demon. Uh-huh. Oh, we sure did. And you got the green-haired kid I hate for some reason. Can we call him Harold? Uh, Bruce? Nah. Uh, Bruce? Uh, Bruce? Uh, Bruce? Uh, Bruce? It's not brilliant. It's not spectacular. It's not even original. But it's simple enough to make it distinct. In this film, you got like four or five dozen kids who are unremarkable, interchangeable, and totally forgettable. Honestly, the kids could change in every scene, and I would never notice. They're just generic kids, down to the fact that they literally have no names. What the hell happened to Karen? Did she die of hypothermia? Seriously, what what's going on? The film basically just shoves in this vast spectrum of characters at us hoping that something will stick. There's literally just two horses with hats that hang around the kids throughout the entire film. They don't do anything, they're not significant, they're just there. I don't even think this is the same damn town! Look at this! The original town had a school, normal houses, a suburb, or whatever. This one's got like a, a Victorian village and stables and log cabins. W what the hell, man? Supper time, Frosty. Mom wants us home. When I imagine a second Frosty movie, I expect something like the Santa Claus 2. And I mean that in the nicest way that I possibly could. Christmas comes once a year, and it can be a time of reflection. People grow up between the holidays, and when you see someone once a year, it's going to be a huge jump in their lives. Frosty would represent childhood to these kids. As they grew up, it would be an emotional time to see him again. That would be a powerful and interesting special to see. The real return of Frosty. Instead, the film decides to attempt to abandon the setting and key cast of the original film entirely. The first Frosty film had a bit of a suspenseful story. We have to get Frosty to the North Pole or he will literally melt and die. This film tries its best to recreate the magic for that production, but lacks this central plot element. So it's only a short time before the film runs down its nostalgia meter and has to find a new central plot element that it's going to run with. What is that, you might ask? You know what you need, Frosty? A wife. What's a wife? A Mrs. Frosty, you know? Someone you think is very beautiful, who thinks you're very handsome, and will love you back when you love her. That's right. This is one of those sequels that exists only because the first film did not have a romantic, happy ending. And like most sequels that try this, it's very predictable and boring, and usually comes across as very, very, very sexist. Ugh. Nothing gets me out of the Christmas spirit faster than one of these movies. Ugh. Wait a minute. Frosty representing childhood? Him returning to the person that created him after he's become an adult? Terrible casting decisions. Where have I heard all of this before? No way! Oh, Jesus Christ! Listen to me, boy! There's no such thing as other Frosty sequels! There never were! They don't exist! Okay, I, I believed you before you got so angrily defensive about it. Do not look for other Frosty sequels. They do not exist. They never did. Get the hell out of my house! They're just not real, boy. They never were. They don't exist. Be warned. Be warned. Don't look for the Frosty sequels, Taylor. You may not like what you find. I gotta start locking my doors, man. Winter's no fun without Frosty. 
Frosty. Frosty. That's all I hear. A stupid snowman takes my place just because he has that silly magic hat that brought him to life. That, 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 that hat. Yes. I'll eliminate the hat. And that will be that. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. Jack Frost is the main villain in this film. In this project, Frost is a narcissistic, antagonistic, and straight-up psychopath spirit who grows sour with how other beings than himself have come to represent winter, which he creates by hand every year. This is something that always bothered me as a child. As I mentioned in the previous film, it's been put forward in various projects that all rank and best films are set in one singular universe. If this is true, then this Jack Frost has to be this Jack Frost. The light-hearted, kind, and sentimental spirit who represents winter, which he creates by hand every year. I mean, look, they even have the same costume. This is something that had to have been planned. It's very immediately clear to see why this bothered me so much when I was younger. That the character I loved would grow up to be something so... evil. But as an adult, I can at least try to rationalize it. Okay, so we know right off the bat that Jack Frost, obviously Jack's origin story, is set no more than, let's say, a hundred years after Santa Claus is coming to town. Santa's origin story. Santa is known by the people of the film, but he hasn't expanded enough to deliver presents to them as well. At this time, Frost is seen as the image of the winter holidays. He's admired by all, and rightfully so. His team literally makes snow that falls during the season. Over the years in between their origins and what could be simply detailed as the present of the Rankin-Bass films, Santa has chosen Christmas as his season to represent. Rudolph is the hero of December, and Frosty, the legend of everything snow. His only love, long dead and no longer holding the recognition he deserves, he slowly grows bitter and angry at the world. It's an upsetting transformation, and what a tragic story. Oh, and obviously I didn't put the whole groundhog thing into my calculations, but whatever. Frosty and the kids tried to build him a snow wife, or a snow bride, or, or whatever, designing it to, and I quote, Frosty's specifications. Kind of round and plump. With the top of a head Don't worry, 1970s, feminism is on its way. Despite the best efforts, they just can't bring her to life, no matter how many silly hats they put on her. Nothing. Nothing. Gee, well, it was a nice idea anyway. Yeah, things were pretty sad for Frosty. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. I keep getting the impression that the people making this film didn't watch the first one again before they started writing it. Um, the hat that Frosty wears is is magical. It's, it's very specific. You can't just pull it from a horse, you know. It's it's stiff. It's really stuffed with magic. You know, you're not going to find another hat like this pretty easily. You know what I mean? Uh, I just, they mentioned this in the film, right? So the writers have to know, but Frosty clearly doesn't know. What's up with that? Does Frosty have a bad memory? Is that why he can't tell that these aren't the same kids he met right after coming to life the first time? I imagine that snow can't be the best thing to construct the inner mechanisms of the human mind. Frosty stays out that night and watches over his bride hoping that she will come to life. As a gift, he gives her a bouquet of ice flowers, which is apparently enough to do the trick. And suddenly, as the wintry stars twinkled down, Frosty's gift of love, those simple flowers, worked an icy miracle. Happy birthday. Interesting note, if you watch that clip, you'll notice that the Aurora Borealis appears and behind them just as Crystal comes to life. In the next film, Aurora is revealed to be a powerful spirit who washes over the Earth. 
She gave Rudolph his nose to fight for good and put Winterbolt to sleep and, you know, some other stuff. I guess she also trades in magical talking snowmen, I guess. Jack Frost steals Frosty's hat, which I guess is basically attempted murder, and gloats over his corpse. No more Frosty, no more Frosty. <laughs> no more Frosty? That's ridiculous. You have a wife, except for the formalities, that is, to help you now. There. Everyone knows the groom should have a flower in his buttonhole. That's just to say, I love you, Frosty. Happy birthday. Now I too can stop feeling dead inside. The townsfolk leave their sheds and run to the couple to help set up the wedding. Two of the kids run off to get a parson to help with the ceremony. But when he saw Frosty and Crystal... Dear me, I didn't know you were snow persons. I'm only allowed to marry real persons. It just wouldn't be legal if I tied this knot. This is a sin against nature and I refuse to participate. Seriously though, the pastor won't marry the snowman because it wouldn't be in the practice of his church. So instead, he builds a snowman pastor, which he literally brings to life by giving him a Bible. A parson's not a parson till he holds the good book in his hand. Happy birthday! Hooray! You know, often I think to myself, the world would be a better place if people acted like they do in Rankin-Bass films. Oh, I can't marry you two because it's against my religion. But I'll allow another pastor to marry you because- I'm not a fucking dick about everything! Uh, other, uh, other thing. Uh, three snowmen that are alive? At this point, you guys are just playing God. Somebody has to. Also, are the two Rudolph narrator snowmen alive by the same means, or is that like a different thing? We see Frost watching over the scene, and he attempts to disrupt the ceremony by creating a ginormous storm. Crystal, during this event, approaches Jack and resolves the situation by accepting him as important and thanking him for everything that he's done over his long life. At this moment, they ask Jack, the creator of winter, to serve as the best man at their wedding. Jack is unsure how to react to this, having not been thanked for his deeds for thousands of years. He becomes excited and decides to throw the bear the best wedding that they could. And of course, it's set to Winter Wonderland. Because since Rudolph and Frosty were both set to musical hits, this film had to be too. The difference is that this film's take on it is so forced and awkward that you usually forget the songs even in the movie until you get to this terrible musical sequence and you get to cringe at every edit. Trees are terrific! <laughs> Okay, so I figured at this point you guys are getting really tired of Christmas in July continuity, but trust me, trust me, this one's really interesting. Okay, so here we see sort of like a flash forward to the rest of Frosty's life, and, and here we see his children, who also appear in the next movie. Okay, so that's Millie, that's Chili, and the third child is never heard from again. Make that of what you will. Sometime after the wedding, Crystal notes that it is warming up and they need to get back to the pole. Jack Frost points out that as a god of winter, he can do whatever the hell he wants and keeps the holiday growing. This goes on for a few minutes before the pastor returns to remind them that what they are doing is disrupting nature's course. Winter? Never end? Well, that might be fun for you, but what about all the trees? With new green leaves inside them, just busting to be born. And what about the seeds and the bulbs deep in the ground? Nature made them a promise that someday they'd be pretty flowers. Can you imagine how you'd feel if someone broke such a promise to you? Okay, so once again, it's really funny to watch this character knowing the modern context of how religious fanatics act in the political atmosphere. 
Uh, this entire part of the film is pointless and forgettable and really should have been left on the cutting room floor. Realizing that they have committed a sin and will be sentenced to hell, the three decide to return to the North Pole and allow Spring to come to the planet. Oh, and they suddenly run into the traffic cop in the first movie and do the exact same bit again. Stop! 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 That nice. Once they come Us to life, they know nothing. nothing. Come to Us life! I know why! <laughs> it's funny because it's the exact same thing as before. Seriously, this is the weirdest part of the film because the art style just totally shifts to more closely mimic the first one for this character in this part of town. The three leave on the train and spring and summer finally arrive as Jack Frost has left. Now here's something that just crossed my mind. If all Rankin Best films are set in the same singular universe, and we know at least that this film and The Year Without a Santa Claus are set in the same universe. Then do both Jack Frost and Snow Miser exist? Okay, so we know that both work for Mother Nature, as explicitly mentioned and shown in both films. I take my orders from nature. When she gives me a certain sign, I know it's my time to leave. My personal theory is that, as the misers constantly battle over Christmas snow or Christmas heat, that Snow Miser oversees Christmas snow but not winter all year round. This would be somewhat consistent with them putting away snowflakes into storage for Christmas Day. Also, it's interesting to know- oh look, the movie's over. Oops. I gotta say it. What a lackluster sequel for Frosty. And other than the crossover, that's basically it! Okay, straight up, this is basically a Disney sequel. It barely connects to the original, it totally misses the point entirely, and has no point in existing other than the fact that the first film was a hit. The Crystal plotline is pretty borderline PC nowadays, the kids are forgettable, the animation is average stuff, and honestly occasionally creepy, and the songs seem forced in. It's definitely one worth skipping. What a truly sad note for the series. If anything, what it works best on is concluding Jack's story. I just feel like Frosty deserves better as a character. A story! A film series! And even... a legend. Wait a minute. I remember this from when I was a kid. This is an Arnie this is... This is... This is... I... Hate... This! Aw, oh, Jesus! Here we go, another archetype, terrible, bad sequel! Ugh, it's the absolute last thing you want from a Rankin Best film, or any Christmas sequel in general! Oh, so many years I have locked this away in my subconscious, Removing it from my mind, but now I remember, and I will force you to as well! It's okay, it's okay, Kitty. I... No. I'm sorry! <coughs> oh man. All too often... Our happiest memories are packed away between in... science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. This is the story of a town that had forgotten, and the one magical winner that made everyone remember. Okay, so after watching all these movies, I just want to say that there's there's not much different performers can bring to the Frosty the Snowman theme. We start off in the isolated town of Evergreen, which has an ironic name as it evidently lacks all forms of fun and recreation. 
curfew is strictly enforced, playing is disallowed, and a militaristic mindset is employed on all citizens. It's actually weird to see the town's weird customs not be questioned by anyone or anything at the start of the film since it's so extreme. But it all starts to make sense when you notice that the design and art style is trying very hard to make us rationalize the setting of this film as the 1950s. Ah, the 50s. The times of towns being led by coal militias and unions being shot to death. Good times indeed. But this is some next level upper generational shit. The fucking mayor even expects Mother Nature to be in check. Come on, buddy. Be a team player. Atta boy! Jesus Christ, dude, is God on your curfew plan now? Give them bonus points, though. Apparently they've got a 20 years head start on figuring this racism thing out. Sexism is still alive and well, though. You should be practicing your scales. But scales are so... repetitive. And that's the point, Sarah. That's precisely the point. Scales are the foundation of an accomplished pianist. And an air of accomplishment is what makes a girl captivating to a suitor. It's really weird that both Frosty films went out of their way to make their settings purposefully dated when the original film was specifically designed to be timeless and classic. We meet our main character, Tommy Tinkerton, the son of the mayor, who wants to be his father's number one but always ends up feeling like number two. Dad, I had the strangest dream last night. Not now, sport, okay? Put some hop in your hustle, put some grease in your muscle, you are gonna be late. Who's going out for morning inspection? You are! Right off the bat, I think many of you can see the obvious problem that plagues films like this. And that is the very small acting community that these films and projects of that era limited themselves to. Every time I watch one of these films, I'm bombarded with the sense of the voices I'm listening to just being stock voices you pull from the closet because all these actors were so overused in the early 2000s. So they, uh, switched pencils on us, did you notice? They used to use the number two, and now they're using the number four. But me, I've always been a fan of number two. Yeah, Lillian, stop talking so loud. I wasn't talking loud, Philip. Doll on the court. Bugs. <laughs> Don't wear it out! Good morning, children! Our hands are clean and neatly folded! Hey, watch it! You watch it! Would you two can it? Hi, my name is Emily Elizabeth. Are these Madame Foster's cookies? No way! I've known about the invasion for months. Not like Fred. He's like one of those geniuses that no one understands until they're dead. Danny, I swear! Dark days, I wish I had never even met you! Perfect. Show yourself, coward! It's a little more tolerable with Tom Kenny here, but once you notice it's him, y you can't stop noticing it. Way to shine, big guy! <laughs> The students try their best to stay in formation as they head to school, but Tommy is distracted by what looks like a flying hat, which is following them around. Hey, would you believe me if I told you I was being followed by a yellow submarine? Uh, uh, mm. No, no, I would not. Oh yeah, I doesn't think you would. Soup spoon, largest on the table. Move soup in counterclockwise motions to cool. Never blow, never slurp, never set soil spoon on tablecloth. Wait until others have finished before moving on to the salad course. Ooh, look out! Queen of England! Line one! Wants to know if you're available for tea? Bonus <laughs> round! Toast asparagus, hors d'oeuvres, fruity tea, crepes, cocktail wieners, olives, pickles, nuts, deviled eggs, chips! Yes, 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 yes! Jesus Christ, calm down. So, from what I can figure, this part of the film is trying to set up the town as dysfunctional and bland so that Frosty can enter later, make it all magical and whatnot. But the stylization and animation is so over the top that it honestly does the opposite. A talking snowman entering the room would seem like the most sane moment in this scene. I can't 
can't. I already let my dad down once today. I just can't. See, this is what I'm talking about. Kid sees his fucking window drawing become an animated snowman, and he's like, Oh, man, if I go out, my dad will be pissed. Sorry. You can rinse those dinner dishes while you're in there, Walter. Rinse the dinner dishes. And don't make the water too hot, or you'll burn yourself, Walter. Burn myself, Walter. And don't let the water run full black, or you'll wet yourself, oh, Walter. Water. So good, so good, so messy. Oh, no, I, oh, I didn't, I wasn't supposed to, the water, oh. This is going to be the worst character in the film, isn't it? Since Tommy refuses his offer to go outside and play, the hat instead sneaks out to his friend, Urkel. <laughs> that was incredible! Hat? Where are you, Hat? Urkel has a brilliant stroke of thought as he puts the hat on a pile of snow, which chips away to finally reveal our hero. That Squidward? Is that Mr. Krabs in there? Do I hear a bit of sandy cheeks? No, this is Patrick. Okay, okay, I get that the original Frosty voice actor passed away a long time ago. But when they were looking to replace him, did they really, really have to go with one of the most recognizable voices in modern animation? Anyone ever teach you the right way to make a snowball? An actual snowball? Like on TV? The key is to find some good wet snow. Heap it on, don't be stingy, and firmly grasp it in your hand. <laughs> Ready? Set. Okay, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say that it worked a, a, at least a little bit, but, you know, it's still a bad movie. Walter and Frosty have a wonderful night together, and Frosty gives Walter the courage to stand up to his mother. Hello, mother. W Walter? What is the meaning of this? I thought you were in your bed, fast asleep. What in the world were you doing out there? I guess I was having fun. I am an anti-coaster! I am an anti-coaster! But in doing this, Walter has broken the town's strict curfew and has to be punished by the school. Walter, waiter, please rise. Shape up! I'm gonna squash you like a bug. So I suggest you watch your back, Walter. It was the first time in Evergreen history that the detention room had been used. They had to find a special key just to open. I find it really annoying and also upsettingly accurate that bullying only goes punished in this school when it starts to affect the adults. The principal and the mayor give Walter one last chance to tell the truth, but he falls for the old main character tells the truth, but the people around him think he's being arrogant because the truth is too silly to sound like it isn't a lie bit. Well, if you really must know, I was playing with a magical snowman. Ma ma magical snowman? Yeah, you heard me. Wait a minute. Is it my imagination, or...? It is most definitely your imagination, sir. Magical snowmen do not exist! I'll give this movie some credit, at least it's a little complex, to the level that I can't just skip most of the movie and list what happens in various unfunny paragraphs. Tomorrow's another day, sir. Tomorrow is indeed another day. Oh my goodness. Because you're just making it too easy. You're just going down down the trope list. The, 
the, the jokes that SpongeBob did best. The next day, Tommy follows Frosty's hat through the town into a library, where he finds a hidden compartment. We meet again, my old enemy. But this time, I shall be victorious! Jeez. There he comes across a series of hidden books, which topple over and reveal a comic. Frosty the Snowman. The secret and never-ending adventures of Frosty the Snowman? Kid, I don't know what to tell you, that's not on the front of the comic. Once upon a time, there was a boy who didn't believe in magic. Ironically, it's the green haired kid. Ironically, his father was a magician. Whoa, 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 hold up. Is that the magician from the first film? What is happening? Wait, so the magician is the father of one of the kids from the first movie? Oh, well, that's one of those retcons that, like, I guess could be true. It's one of those things I just didn't bring up, but still kind of doesn't work. Now hold on. Now hold on. So, a totally different character created Frosty? Oh my god, this isn't a sequel at all, it's a reboot! Tommy comes back up from the book dungeon to find his father looking for him. His father gives him the number one pin originally owned by his brother. Despite this, it's clear that he can't quite take the strain to the town becoming normal. Jeez Louise, where did I go wrong? Seems like every kid in town is breaking the rules. Meanwhile, Walter and the older boy see Frosty out the window and run to join him. Pretty soon all the other kids in town are also starting to experience Frosty events one by one, each coming to love their new freedom. It's really weird in this film that everyone reacts to Frosty like he's not that weird a thing. Like in the previous two films, they at least show people freaking out and falling over and stuff. In this film, it's just like, Oh look, a talking snowman! Cool! That's right, boys. Mondo Cool. Tommy comes home after feeling isolated by his peers and finds his mother looking through old family photos. It is here that he is shocked to learn the big twist of the movie. Mom? Who's this? Why, that's your father when he was your age, playing with your grandfather's hat. He was a magician, you know. It's really weird how both of these films try to have their own unique style, yet use the original designs without adjusting them in the slightest. Way to shine, big guy! Feel that golden glow? Gosh, that's warm stuff! What the mouse? That's right, little man. Not even God stands with you now. Frosty continues to visit the kids nightly to remind them of the true gift of childhood, also leading to the destruction of order in the town. As this occurs, the mayor begins to suffer an extreme breakdown and literally shuts himself off. That means there's only one person left to be in charge. The principal. Wanting to capture Frosty discreetly, he tricks Walter into leading him out in the middle of the night. This leads to an incident where Frosty falls through a thin bed of ice and is totally destroyed. Tommy realizes that his comic is starting to grow and comes to the realization that the principal was the one who locked the hat away to begin with. The boys realize they have to stop the principal. <clears throat> Sorry, the mayor. Hey! Sorry, the principal mayor. And that to successfully do so, they have to start a political revolution to take Frosty's hat back. To do this, they all band together in the middle of the night breaking curfew in the action. Who's there?
He's back! <laughs> Get him! Eh, he's insane, but he pays me well. The kids steal the hat back from the school, but in doing so, set off all the alarms. This wakes the whole town, who come to see what the commotion is about. I know what it looks like. I know what it looks like, people. Pankley says don't look at the snowman, or whatever that is, or isn't. It's not there. Boys! Dad, I want to introduce you to an old friend of yours, Frosty the Snowman. Is that really you? Man. You got old, huh? I thought I'd made you up. <laughs> what took you so long? I hit a little detour along the way. In this moment, the town begins to embrace chaos. They realize that a little leniency and a, and a bit of fun is not a bad thing. In fact, it's an essential part of growing up. Thus, they come to terms with the fact that they have been living their lives wrong all along. And they burn Pinkley on the stake for his crimes against humanity. And Tommy grew up to have everything he ever wanted. Take it from me, because, well... You're Tommy? I'm Tommy. Ugh, so that was Frosty's Winter Wonderland, and my god, what a terrible sequel! Well, let's be fair, that's a pretty good movie. Let's be real here, I think we all know how the pitch for this film went. Okay, so we got this great idea. It's about childhood. It's about childhood. It's about growing up. It's a town. It's a film. It's about a town. It's upright. 1950 town. Let us be lean. Thanks to a magical being who teaches some reason to be laid back and be cool. I gotta say, Tom, uh, that sounds like a terrible film, Tom. It will make no money whatsoever. All right, all right, Bill. Hear me out, Bill. Hear me out, Bill. What if we put a Frosty the Snowman? Frosty the Snowman is in the movie now. What, what about that, Bill? I mean, this this very clearly isn't a sequel to Frosty. The universes just don't add up. You could argue that it makes sense as an idea to be set inside the universe of the first film alone, but only if you ignore the plotline showing the magician and his kid. That just blatantly breaks all continuity with the first film, down to giving him a different name. However, I do appreciate this. The film did manage to capture the spirit of the first film much better than other projects arguably have. Frosty just works better as a figure of good, more so than a literal person with a family and kids. Also appreciate the nods to the classic, even though they're clearly trying to disconnect themselves from it. Like this Hocus Pocus cameo. Overall, if I was being 100% honest, I can't say I really hate either films. One I like for the utter justification of it just being a good movie, and the other I like because, well, I grew up with it, and I like the passion that went into it. I even like the performances, even if it was all so misguided. Both are somewhat fun, and I'd say worth checking out, but uh, only one of them's on Netflix, so I guess which one you're more likely to look at at that. So, okay, so I had this pit plan for the end of the video. I was gonna, I built a snowman, right? It looked like Frosty, and I was, you know, I was gonna be like an ad thing, like, hey, say goodbye, Frosty, but uh, I waited too long, and uh, yeah, this is what's left. Kind of looks like Kentucky, doesn't it? Look at that, right there. So, say goodbye, Frosty. Goodbye! Goodbye! Uh, okay, okay, good. Play the end slate. Frosty the snowman was a jolly happy soul With a corn cup pipe and a button nose And two eyes made out of coal Frosty the 